All right, it looks like we're getting a number of people um, and I wanna make sure we stick to time. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining um, today's webinar. My name is Kelly Whetstone. I'm on the board of AC, um, ACC Northeast. Um, and today we are happy to be joined with Veral Dana to be, talk about romance and relationships in the workplace. Um, a little about, about Veral, who has been an um, ACC sponsor for many years. Um, Veral has been around since 1862. Veral is a full service law firm with more than 130 attorneys and seven offices throughout the Northeast. The attorneys provide award-winning client service to business and individuals across the country and around the globe in a variety of areas and industries, including construction, energy, food and beverage, health, higher education, manufacturing, technology, and telecommunications, among others. Today, we are joined for two attorneys from Verrill's labor and employment practice, Beth Smith and Liz Johnson, who I'm gonna turn it over to in a second. I just wanna remind everybody that today's presentation will last for one hour. It has been approved by for SHRM and Maine CLE credits. Um, check the link in the chat box for more information about that and a copy of the today's presentation. This is being recorded if you need to watch it at a later date or wanna share with a coworker. Please keep your phone on mute when you're not speaking and use the chat box to ask questions throughout and the speakers will try to get to you to they can. If your question isn't answered or if you come up with a question after the fact, um, Beth and Liz's emails are right there on the first slide. Please feel free to reach out to them and they're happy to help. Um, and I think at that point, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth, Beth and Liz. Thanks so much, Kelly, and hello, everybody. We're very excited to be here with you this afternoon to uh, talk about sexual harassment claims and complications with relationships at work. Um, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Liz Johnston, and I'm an attorney in Verrill's Employment and Labor Group, and Beth Smith is with me as well. Um, I first want to thank ACC for the opportunity to present on this topic today. And you know, I, I, my practice at Verrill focuses on all aspects of employment law, uh, from wage and hour issues to policy drafting to litigation, often on discrimination issues. And I enjoy the opportunity to present on sexual harassment um, in particular for a couple reasons. First, because it may not be surprising that sexual harassment claims are often very interesting, um, both factually and legally. Um, so we really enjoy the practice of that, but also because the reality is that sexual harassment is still happening. Um, you know, Everybody's on. Fine. Everybody's on. Doing it. Hatton, Burger, Siwoo. Uh, can you please mute your phone if you're not talking? Um, Thank you. We both have bad record. Oh, somebody's line isn't muted. Oh, perfect. Um, as I was saying, the second reason is because sexual harassment at work is still, still a thing. Um, so the extent that you and your role as counsel for your organization um, can get a better understanding of what sexual harassment looks like, how to identify it, and what to do in response, um, it's so helpful to help mitigate not only risk to your organization, but also prevent the harassment from happening in the first place. Um, so it's always, I think, really important to keep these conversations open. So today we're talking specifically about what sexual harassment looks like in the context of relationships at work. And you can go to the next slide, please. Oh. Perfect. Um, so as to kick that off, we'll talk a little bit about what makes um, workplace relationships so special, you know, and, and relevant in this context. Um, and we'll talk about the legal liabilities that can potentially result from workplace relationships, both with the goal of helping you issue spot in your own organization and identify and respond to situations that may arise. Lastly, we'll focus on practical guidance and best practices. Um, again, once you're able to issue spot these, these things in your workplace, we'll discuss um, what we recommend as far as how to help mitigate and prevent these issues as well as discuss some of the current trends that we're seeing in employment law, both um, local and national scale, related to sexual harassment claims and relevance to the workplace. So next slide, please. 
before we dive into the content, it would be helpful for Beth and I to get a sense of your familiarity with the issues. Um, so if we could just do a quick poll really quickly for everybody on the line, uh, just to get a sense of if you've ever had an experience with a workplace romance or relationship issue um, in your role at your organization, is this something that you're familiar with? I'm just give it just a moment to pop up there. Or if you want to drop a response in the chat, that would be great too. But. All right. Not seeing the poll come up, so we might just skip this part. Um, technical difficulties. But uh, in any case, if you, Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. If you just want to drop in the chat, you know, yes or no, if you're familiar, um, you know, if you've had to deal with a, a workplace relationship issue, it looks like we've had a few yeses, which is interesting. So a lot of these topics might be something that you've seen or experienced, and um, hopefully we will shed some additional light that will. Uh, be relevant to these issues going forward as you continue to to be exposed to that. Uh, so we'll jump to the next slide to get into the content here. A lot of yeses, interesting. And one more slide, please. So the idea of office romances and relationships is certainly not anything new, right? I mean, if you've watched The Office or you know, we see it all the time in pop culture and a lot of you have seen it in your own work environments. This is something that's happening, um, you know, pretty frequently. But the topic is so relevant now, um, you know, as we've seen developments like the Me Too movement and frankly, the current pandemic state of the world as well. Um, a 2021 study by the Society for Human Resource Management found that one third of workers have been involved or are currently involved in an office romance and a quarter of workers either started a new romance during the pandemic or continued an existing romance. So we're talking about something that's relevant to a third of your workforce um, and COVID certainly hasn't put a damper on these issues either. In fact, it may have even exacerbated uh, the issues of office romances considering that people aren't getting their usual social outlets. They're not going as many places. Um, and so you might be getting a majority of your socialization in the workplace and that's where you're meeting people. So it makes sense. But the, you know, it's still obviously important to be aware of the risks of, of those romances. So some of the unique issues about the workplace um, create, you know, the liability associated with these. And one of those unique factors is the power imbalance that's often involved in participants in workplace romances. You know, we're not always talking about romances or relationships between people who are on the same professional level or the same playing field. Um, you know, it's often common in the outside world, um, outside of the office for relationships to involve people with different finances or social standing, different jobs. But in the workplaces, those differences are really exacerbated and can have a direct impact on the dynamics of that relationship, um, especially when we're talking about somebody who might be in a supervisory position uh, with somebody who's in, in a lower level in the organization, even if it's not directly supervisory. What does that look like? Um, one way that we see that is in the perceived ability to consent to requests by a partner. That's one way it could show up. Uh, this could apply to both work-related tasks and non-work-related tasks. So, you know, imagine you have a manager and an employee who are in a romantic relationship and the manager asks the employee to engage in perhaps less than ethical activity in the workplace, um, something that might be contrary to the organization's interests. There's a possibility that the employee could feel pressured to engage in that activity because it's their romantic partner asking, not just their boss or not just someone they're working with. Um, they might also fear reprisal for not engaging in that conduct. Uh, so that can certainly be an area of liability for the organization. We could also see this in personal aspects of the relationship, you know, uh, in intimate interactions and requests. 
it's not just romantic partners, it's your boss, you know? And there might be, an, again, an elevated fear for impact on their work environment if they're not consenting to activity. Um, and while that is certainly a personal issue, uh, it can absolutely become an employer issue uh, with sexual harassment claim. Another impact or um, factor that we see is that workplace romances impact those outside of the relationship as well. You know, it's pretty clear that, you know, people who might not have a positive ending or a positive experience with a relationship might not have the best experience working together um, if anything were to happen. Um, but those outside the relationship are affected as well and it really can harm the company's bottom line. Um, there's a survey from a few years ago that showed that a third of respondents felt employees gained a professional advantage by being in an office relationship. So if employees outside of a relationship feel disadvantaged because they're not participating, they may not be inclined to stay at the organization if they feel that it values that. Um, we'll talk more later about the legal claims that employees outside relationships may have, um, but certainly something to consider from a profit margin. Also, there's risk of conflicts and ethical issues. Um, you know, looking back to that power imbalance, if you, you know, have people who are in a relationship treating each other differently or more favorably or less favorably than other people outside, uh, it could create conflicts of interest or questions from other people about why certain decisions were made. Even if it doesn't rise to legal liability, um, there might still be professional ethical implications that are arise there. Technology is another aspect uh, in the workplace I think it's worth mentioning because it's so intertwined with legal liability. Um, so think about text message, emails, social networking, um, all of that makes flirting easier in the office and in, in general. Um, and tone and body language can't necessarily be conveyed through those means. So there's risk that you know, flirting might be misinterpreted or communications might be misinterpreted and that leads to potential harassment claims. And technology also creates a written record of all of these potentially inappropriate conducts. Um, you know, emails and chats can live indefinitely and be very helpful, frankly, to support a claim of sexual harassment if one is made down the road. And that's something that, you know, you and your HR departments might not be aware of uh, until you get document requests in the form from a lawsuit asking for all of the text messages between your supervisors and supervisees. Um, and then you find the nefarious content um, in that context, which is never fun. Uh, so it's, a way, it's important to just be aware of the role that technology can play before um, it goes to, something goes to litigation. And then lastly, just briefly negative publicity, um, office romances, especially, um, those involving high profile parties or companies um, can certainly make the news. We've seen it in the last couple of years, but you know, news spreads so quickly with technology and social media. It's just important to keep uh, tabs on how, how information is being spread and your organization is being relayed if there was ever an issue with an office romance going south. So with that, jump to the next slide and Beth will talk about some of the legal liabilities. Yeah, I want to just um, also sort of reemphasize the last point Liz was making. Um, I happen to know there's a law firm in the greater Philadelphia area that was sued for sex harassment and discrimination yesterday. And by early afternoon, the complaint was everywhere. So technology moves fast, friends. Just keep that in mind. If I know about it up in Maine, it's everywhere. Um, could we do the next slide, please, Anne? All right, first, I'm just going to give you a two second story about me. I'm Beth Canellan Smith. I am of counsel at Barrel in the Labor and Employment Group. I've been practicing with the group for about 23 years now. Um, I'm also currently the chair of the American Bar Association Workers' Comp uh, section, general committee, and I'm the main representative for Verrill to the National Workers' Compensation Defense Network. I do practice all aspects of employment law, but I do a lot of workers' comp. That's um, where I started and I have a pretty deep background there. So let's jump into this. Who can bring claims? Like everybody, let's just call it like it is, anybody. A claim for sexual harassment, sexual assault, hostile work environment, constructive discharge, 
reputational damage, intentional infliction of emotional distress, interference with an advantageous economic relationship, retaliation, discrimination, that can be bought, brought by virtually any employee or vendor as long as the elements of the claim can be shown, as you all know. A coworker could report an affair that makes him or her feel uncomfortable in the workplace. A vendor might report unwanted texts or invitations from a representative of the company. And it just makes problems in the workplace, as you can imagine, that we don't need because there's enough that needs to be done just to get the work done. And could you advance? All right, let's talk just super quickly about the applicable laws. So you may all know about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That prohibits discrimination on the basis of characteristics such as um, unwanted sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature that explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment. And that applies to any employer with 15 or more employees, and they can rise to the level of sexual harassment when they unreasonably interfere with an individual's work performance or create a hostile or offensive work environment. State laws generally also prohibit unwelcome sexual advances, requests for favors, or other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. nature. So you could be dealing with both state and federal claims if someone were to bring forward a claim under that type of scenario. Some states also allow for individual liability as well as what they call, I'm doing air quotes, accomplice liability. And um, as I said, many, many states also include um, visitors, vendors as someone who could prompt liability. So it could be, you know, Michael from the office, Dunder Mifflin, who's making inappropriate comments when he drops off the paper. And you might not necessarily know about that until it rises to a level that needs to be addressed. And then you've got to sort through, how do we address this? If this is a valued vendor or a valued customer, and yet we obviously value our employees and we need to provide a safe work environment. So that's what we're hoping you'll get some pointers and takeaways today from this discussion about. So there are some other laws too. I went through most of them, but one of the laws that folks don't usually think of is my little sweetheart there, workers' compensation. Depending on the jurisdiction, you may the, the injured employee may be able to make out a claim under the Workers' Compensation Act, as long as they can show that the, the harassing behavior arose out of and in the course of employment. Um, it does depend on the jurisdiction because some jurisdictions require an actual physical injury in order to fall within the ambit of the Workers' Compensation Act. But many jurisdictions, Maine is one of them, you can have purely a mental stress injury and that may be compensable um, depending on the fact pattern. Can we have the next slide in? So there's two principal types of sexual harassment. Quid pro quo, which is, it's out there, it's when a su supervisor seek, seeks sexual favors, try to say that four times fast, um, in exchange for an employment benefit, generally to a subordinate employee. The employment benefit can take virtually any form. Most often, it's a promise of promotion, preferred job duties, perhaps a preferred shift schedule, um, or some other benefit available as a result of the employment. But it can also exist in the context of continued employment in exchange for requested sexual favors. The important point here, it's obviously has to be shown to be unwanted and unwelcome, but if an employee is successful in showing that, there's strict liability for an employer. So anything you do to mitigate, it doesn't matter. There's strict liability. The second most common kind is hostile work environment. So. The, the elements to be made out would be the employer would have to be in a protected class, but that can be gender. Um, it could be any of the protected classes. It could be nationality, it could be gender, it could be sexual orientation, it could be any of those protected classes, age. It again has to be unwelcome. Um, it has to be based on sex or gender, but that that please don't mistake that to mean that you cannot have same sex sexual hostile work environment sexual harassment because you can't. So I don't want that ever to slip by any of you. Um, be on the lookout. 
The harassment has to be sufficiently severe or pervasive so as to alter the conditions of employment and create an abusive work environment. That can be tricky because if it's truly, truly egregious but only happened once, don't, don't immediately assume that that's not gonna meet that prong of the test. It's, it, you really got it's very fact specific and you really got to drill down on if that was actions that were so offensive, every person on the planet would find them unwelcome and that they would have created an abusive work environment, that may be enough. The sexual conduct has to be objectively as well as subjectively offensive, such that a reasonable person would find it to be hostile or abusive. And the second piece of that is that the victim or recipient of the behavior did in fact find the conduct to be so. And then there has to be some basis for employer liability that's been established, such as an adverse employment action that's linked to the objectionable behavior. Um, Liz is gonna talk, I believe, a little bit more about potential defenses to a hostile work environment claim, but there are some potential defenses. They're, the best known one is called the farragut Ellerth defense, which is once you are made aware of the harassment, if you as the employer take steps to investigate and remedy the situation, you may enjoy a defense to the claim. And so for that reason, when we're talking later about best practices, um, you really wanna think long and hard as you initiate any investigation. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna give you a few, we thought we'd have a few hypotheticals just to make this a little more lively. So let's run through the hypothetical here. So Alice is hired as a direct report to supervisor Sam. Sam starts calling Alice into his office, door closed or requests that the door is closed. And then he starts discussing seemingly non-work related things that are becoming increasingly personal to Sam. His attention makes her uncomfortable, but at the same time, Sam's a great sponsor of Alice and doesn't hesitate to tell anybody who will listen how good she is at her job, how efficient she is, and how she's destined for greatness. After a while, Sam asks Alice to get a drink with him after work and she doesn't want to, but she fears for her new position and fears that she might lose her sponsor within the company. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted you to see a couple of different causes of action that could arise out of that fact scenario. So the, the easy one probably was the quid pro quo, right? The implication that Alice will lose, this, lose Sam's sponsorship if she doesn't capitulate to his wishes. Retaliation, what if she tries to, what if she tells a manager and asks, or doesn't even tell a manager, but asks for a promotion or a, a move to a different department to get away from Sam, but she's not chosen. That could be retaliation. It will depend on the facts. And we sure hope Sam wasn't involved in the decision as to whether she got that, that lateral move or that promotion, because that will certainly complicate the defense. If Alice does report the behavior to a manager, she might potentially, depending on the facts, have a whistleblower claim. And then finally, what if all of this is making Alice really stressed out? She's not eating anymore. A prior eating disorder has come up again. That could be a workers' compensation claim, believe it or not. So please don't fail to notify your workers' compensation insurance coverage of a potential assertion of a claim. It could be as simple as Alice simply saying to the manager when she reports the behavior, you know, this, this stuff with Sam has me so, so upset and so stressed. I'm not sleeping. I'm not eating. Um, I'm sick to my stomach all the time. I'm just completely stressed. That might be enough. And, and you don't want to be the one who failed to notice that and failed to notify your insurer. Next slide, please. Here's our second hypothetical from my little realm of the world here. Jason is hired as the new de development di director at a nonprofit. He reports to executive director Madison. On the first day, Madison comes into Jason's office and comments on how well his slim fit shirt fits him. Jason's uncomfortable and asks Madison to remain on professional topics, please. Madison's comments on Jason's physique and looks continue unabated. Finally, Jason complains to the board chair. Not long after, before perhaps the investigation can be started, Jason gets a bad review from Madison recommended for demotion and a new development officer, Oliver, is quickly hired. Let's go on to our... If, so that's a good, so if I could take a second, we have a really good question. 
And it's at what point does the employer have the, the um, liability for quid pro quo harassment? And this is, this is, that's one of the best questions you could ask, honestly, because one of the things that we need you to understand is any knowledge a supervisor has is imputed knowledge to the company. So if, it's, if Sam's a supervisor, even if Sam didn't tell anyone, he obviously knew what he was doing, that could potentially re result in strict liability for the employer. So I don't wanna scare the, you know, Willie's out of you here, but please take that kind of situation seriously and um, make sure that you are monitoring what's going on in your workforce. It's hard, I'm sure, because some of you have very large workforces, but that's, that's the honest answer to the, the question that was posed. All right, so for Jason's situation here, um, may, does he have quid pro quo? It, 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 would, you know, it would depend. It hasn't gone beyond, in my little hypo, it hasn't gone beyond inappropriate comments on his appearance and dress. So there's no physical manifestation for a desired relationship, but is it implied? I don't know. That might be a question for the jury. Hostile work environment, um, I think that would be something that could probably be a claim that was advanced because as you noticed in the hypothetical, I said this continued even after Jason promptly asked it to stop. So he did the right thing and asked for it to stop. He just took a little while to report it to the board chair. That's not unusual. Um, many employees will do that because if they're new, they, they number one, hope that their request that the behavior stops stops the behavior. And second of all, they don't wanna be seen as rocking the boat or being the squeaky wheel. Retaliation, well, if in fact something about Jason's review is true, would that alter the um, suggestion of retaliation? Excuse me, I have to cough a sec. Sorry about that. Maybe can Jason maintain a whistleblower claim for reporting the behavior to the board chair? What other liability might be there? Would there possibly be liability individually for Madison? So these are all questions and other claims that might come up. I don't know, depending on the facts, there might be a workers' compensation claim. There might be an adverse interference with an economic, I mean, interference with an, an um, economic relationship claim if he's demoted and now he's not having access to the donors that he would have had access to before. So there's a whole panoply of claims that could arise out of that scenario. All right, next slide, please. All right, so in addition to those claims that Beth just reviewed um, that are brought typically by those who are either directly involved by a part or um, directly involved in a relationship or party to a relationship, um, hostile work environment perhaps excluded as we'll talk about, uh, there are a number of ways in which other people can be held or um, can be can have standing or have a claim for sexual harassment as well. So one of those concepts is of course the hostile work environment and Beth talks a little bit about that. Um, but even for those individuals who aren't the target necessarily of uh, sexual harassment um, directly, they can still have a hostile work environment claim if there's activity going on in the workplace that creates a hostile work environment for them incidentally. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the context of a hypothetical um, here in a few minutes. But another concept is related to favoritism. And this one's particularly uh, relevant to workplace relationships because you know that's one of the issues we talked about with workplace relationships is um, those involved in the relationship might be treated more favorably than other people um, at the expense of opportunities for other people. So not, you know, not all favoritism though in the workplace is problematic um, or, or going to result in liability. It's one thing, you know, of course, to give somebody preferential treatment because they are a top performer or put the most hours in or are most dedicated to a job. But it's that favoritism that results from, like I said, the romantic relationship or a sexual preference where things start to get a little bit murky um, and, you know, red flags are definitely raised from a legal sense. So the EEOC actually recognizes three different categories of sexual favoritism. That's isolated, coerced, and widespread favoritism. So I just wanna talk a little bit about those three concepts. Um, isolated favoritism refers to 
uh, when, you know, say we have a manager who's in a relationship with either you know, another manager or an employee. And that person in the relationship, that employee, for example, is given preferential treatment over other employees because they are dating the manager. Um, so the other employees aren't, you know, may not be pleased by this. And the question is, do they have a claim? Uh, and the answer is not necessarily. Um, courts have actually held that favoritism toward a single love interest like that, you know, while it might result in things that are unfair, um, those other employees might not have a claim because, you know, the logic is that they are being treated adversely or discriminated against purely because they're not the love interest. It's not because of their gender or their sex or any protected trait. At what point trait. do you think we can... Oh, sorry, just double check um, everybody if your lines are on mute, that would be great. Um, the, so in those situations, it's, you know, that favoritism toward that single employee might not lead to other claims because they're not being discriminated against on the basis of sex. But the coerced and widespread favoritism are a little trickier. So coerced favoritism is say when an employee becomes favored or favorited because they submitted to a sexual request or a coercion by somebody else at the organization. That could certainly be a basis for quid pro quo harassment like Beth was talking about. And other employees of the same gender could also claim that they were denied job advancement or denied benefits because they would not submit to the coercion. So the EEOC has taken the position that even if other people weren't asked to do those things or to submit to demands, um, they can still have a claim because they were injured by the coercion and the favoritism that occurred because of it. Similarly, widespread favoritism, this is where you have an environment where um, you know, a sexual harasser has exhibited favoritism toward perhaps a whole, an entire gender or you know, one particular sex. Uh, and so if that leads to sending a message in the workplace that sexual favors are, are you know, sort of an unspoken job requirement or creates uh, you know, uncomfortable or sexually charged work environment, those individuals who are part of that group, who are part of that widespread favoritism uh, could argue that they were subjected to harassment by virtue of being in that type of work environment. And that could potentially lead to a hostile work environment claim. So next is retaliation. And I know most, you know, hopefully you all know, uh, it's illegal to retaliate against somebody who is engaged in protected activity. And this definition of protected activity varies slightly state by state, um, but it generally includes activity like making a complaint of harassment or participating in an investigation. And when we think about retaliation, we often think about somebody getting fired because they made a complaint or um, somebody getting put on the night shift because they gave a, a bad report or gave a, a truthful but a you know unhelpful report for um, in the context of the sexual harassment claim. That's certainly retaliation, um, but it can also be expanded to sort of a third party theory of retaliation as well. So an employee can actually allege that an employer took an adverse employment action against them in retaliation for the activity of a spouse or a partner. So let's say you have an employee who makes a complaint about sexual harassment in the workplace. And you know, maybe that employee has a spouse or a partner at work. If something happened to that spouse or partner, let's say they got terminated or punished in some way, that spouse or partner, even though they didn't make the report, the fact that they were treated adversely gives them a basis for a claim under Title VII because they were aggrieved by an employer engaging in retaliatory activity toward that other employee by virtue of the relationship. So it's a little, a little circular in some senses, but the point is that the liability for retaliation and for um, sexual harassment claims is a big net uh, potentially. And those people who are only incidentally connected or who you know, aren't, aren't necessarily party to the relationship can absolutely have very viable claims. And that's why it's so important to not only, you know, help prevent these situations from happening, but also make sure that the organization takes steps to address it when 
they do occur. So we'll jump to the next slide and uh, a hypothetical here. So in this hypo, let's say we have a manager, John, and a manager, Joan, and they are in a relationship at work. Um, they've been dating for a few months and it appears that they're both happy, uh, doing well, and there's you know, no issues apparent in the workplace in their relationship. The issue is that Joan regularly shares details about her relationship with John with her employees, Aaron and Emma. And Joan used to work in the same level of the company as Aaron and Emma until she got promoted. So they're, you know, the three of them know each other pretty well and they are friends. So for that reason, Jones feels pretty comfortable sharing very intimate, um, sometimes inappropriate details about her relationship with John. She also sometimes takes digs at Aaron and Emma um, about them still being single and offers to set them up with John's friends and other employees at the company. So Emma doesn't seem to mind the conversations. She participates and laughs along, but Aaron gets uncomfortable hearing the details about John and feels bad. Um, about herself when Joan makes negative comments about her dating life. And Erin's never reported this to Joan, but she did tell another manager that she's close with um, that the discussions make her uncomfortable. So a few weeks later, we have Erin and Emma both applying for a manager role at the company. Emma gets the promotion and Erin doesn't. So what are some of the claims that could be brought and what's the risk look like? We'll jump to the next slide. All right, so first thinking about a hostile work environment, right? So Aaron and Emma are third parties in this situation. So Joan and John don't necessarily have apparent claims against each other. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a favoritism issue here because we don't have any information that Joan is being treated more favorably over Aaron and Emma. And again, even if she was, if it's just Joan, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that Aaron and Emma would be excluded because of their sex. It's just because they're not dating John. That's not necessarily illegal under Title VII. But it's that other activity that could lead to potentially a hostile work environment claim. So depending on the frequency and the intensity of Joan's comments, um, it's possible that the comments, particularly looking at Aaron, um, could be considered really severe and pervasive and affect her work environment. If she knows that she's gonna to come to work and hear sexual details about her manager, which she's really uncomfortable with and be um, you know, made to feel bad about, about her relationship status and her dating status and have to be subjected to questions like that, that could potentially be enough to certainly allege and also succeed on a hostile work environment claim. Um, again, we'd have to know more details about the content itself, but we know that Aaron was uncomfortable with it. It's also um, worth noting that, you know, even if Emma looked like she was having a good time with the conversation and participating, that doesn't necessarily mean that she wasn't uncomfortable. So she might actually have a claim as well, uh, depending on, again, how the facts were to play out. The next issue would be um, potentially a whistleblower claim, right? So again, the standard varies state by state, but if we look at, you know, the main standard, um, protected activity is when an employee makes a report of what an employee has a reasonable cause to believe is a violation of the law. And reporting a violation of the law or suspected violation of law is going to be a pretty consistent part of protected activity across various states. So we would want to think about a few things here. First, we'd wanna think about what Erin actually reported to another manager. If she was reporting the relationship, that's not necessarily illegal. But if she's purporting, reporting sexual harassment or that she feels sexually harassed um, or, or just harassed in general, that could be reporting what she thinks is a violation of the law because sexual harassment is illegal. Then we also have to think about the context of Erin's report. You know, we know that she reported to a manager, but was it in the context of, you know, sharing gossip over a drink or, you know, as a friend? Or was it more of a report made in good faith to stop this behavior from continuing and happening? Um, again, all factual details need to be looked at. And lastly, um, retaliation, of course. You know, we know that Emma seemed to uh, not object to the content of Joan's discussions and Emma 
managed to get a promotion. So again, we're looking at, you know, what did, who was the decision maker for the promotion? What were Emma's and Aaron's qualifications? Um, did the decision maker know about Aaron's report? All of these factual uh, inquiries that can play into whether this constitutes retaliation. And I know that a lot of this um, seems, you know, a lot of this might be something that you're not dealing with on a daily basis. Um, this might be more of your HR department or, you know, they handle performance reviews that, that justify promotions and your managers are the ones making decisions about who is getting promoted to this position or, um, or who's not. But to the extent that you are a part of those discussions or that you could be part of those discussions or are part of creating policies that govern those decisions. This is why it's so important to just be aware of all of the moving parts that go into an analysis of what these claims look like um, so that you can recognize where there might be opportunities to reduce risk and um, figure out if there's going to be liability in certain situations. So that's why I think it's, it's especially relevant um, to your role as counsel as well. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to move this along because I want to get to the meat of what we wanted to leave you with, and we're starting to get short on time. So as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of different um, outcomes that can happen. When we say if violence, uh, you can even replace that with harassment. It doesn't have to be violence because God forbid that happens, but it can happen. But obviously, here's just a quick list. Negligent hiring, negligent supervision, maybe you didn't do the background check, maybe we're not supervising well enough, maybe after it's come to your attention that we've got a problem with someone who either is um, short-tempered, um, uh, too aggressive in pursuit of, I want you to come have a drink with me after work, that could be negligent retention. As you all probably know, under OSHA, there's a, there's a general duty clause to maintain a safe workplace. So there's potential for a claim under OSHA there, and God knows we don't want to visit from anybody from OSHA. And then, as I mentioned, there's the potential for a workers' compensation claim. The, the upside, I guess I'd say, about that is, I'm not sure if you're all aware, but if, if a, a condition is found to be wholly arising out of and in the course of employment, meaning that the harassment or the hostile environment um, arose out of and because of the work alone, uh, it's possible that the employer may enjoy what's known as the exclusivity provision, which means the exclusive remedy is the remedy that's available under the Workers' Compensation Act. Um, the example that comes to mind here in Maine was more of a, a violence, a harassment kind of thing. There were two meat cutters, one of whom had to clean up the area where they were cutting meat at the end of the day. The other one thought it'd be funny to start flinging the meat against the wall. So the one who had to clean up attacked the, the meat flinger with a uh, with his knife. And that was found to be uh, exclusively under workers' compensation, even though obviously it was violence, but they found that it arose entirely out of the employment relationship. So again, just wanna have you people thinking about those things when these um, situations come up, because it's always better to err on the side of asking for guidance as opposed to later asking for forgiveness for having perhaps missed something. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So now we'll dive into some best practices. Um, and the first one that we'll talk about is drafting appropriate policies for your workplace. And I'm sure all of you know how important it is to have policies in place to deal with all of the issues that come up in the employment context. Um, but this is a really great first place to start, um, particularly on sexual harassment issues. So anti-harassment policies, of course, um, make sure they're up to date and make sure that they reflect your organization's current practices. Um, sometimes, you know, you can go years without updating a handbook or a policy. And so there's a reporting structure in there that might not make sense um, if there's been reorganization or you might just have changed the way things are done. Um, so it's important to make sure those are up to date. 
One thing to consider specifically with sexual harassment policies is that more and more states are having um, specific requirements for your sexual harassment policies. So Maine and Massachusetts are two of those states um, in particular, uh, Connecticut as well, I believe, but they have specific requirements about what needs to be included in a policy. For example, in Maine, you need to include contact information for the Maine Human Rights Commission. Um, so that uh, is again, just something to keep in mind and check, especially if you are a company that operates in more than one state, um, your policies might need to be adapted for each place where you operate. Um, Workplace violence is another one that's not on here, but following up on Beth's um, last slide, uh, it's you know becoming more and more important to have like a workplace violence policy in place, um, both generally and you know if you think about it uh, in the workplace relationship context, um, you know again, hopefully nothing would ever get to that level, but uh, having policies and procedures in place to deal with um, whether it be an employee or a, you know, spouse or somebody coming to the work environment, having procedures to address what to do and what employees should, should do in response is important as well. IT and social media policies are also really relevant here. Um, consider what you want to do, your organization wants to do around using company property to make personal communications. Um, if you wanna limit your use of IT resources or social media, um, in the workplace to just work stuff or personal stuff as well, which of course opens opens the doors to other types of content to be discussed. And if I can um, talk on that just for a second, Liz, um, most companies like to have a policy that makes clear to their employees that there's no expectation of privacy on any of the devices. And I think that's probably a good idea. Um, if an employee wants to have a private cell phone as well as a business cell phone, that's fine. Um, but just being clear about what expectations are all around. And quite honestly, we could do a full hour on social media and IT policies, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, no, that's definitely a great point. Um, and I completely agree. You should always have you know, a caveat in there that there's no expectation of privacy in those devices. Um, I will say also for social media, you know, keep in mind that off the clock social media use or technology use can still be a basis for sexual harassment. So even if it's not an employer phone or an employer computer or an employer social media account, people's communications um, over those mediums, even private text messages can definitely come up later. Um, I've had personal experience with cases with this where those, those texts will get brought in um, as evidence of a sexual harassment claim. Um, so that's not necessarily something you can forbid, but it's something that you need to keep in mind um, when you're monitoring uh, communications, at least in the workplace. Uh, so romance policies, you know, here we're talking about um, what your policy will be on whether relationships are okay at all in the workplace. Um, generally speaking, having a policy is helpful uh, to mitigating risk here. Um, you know, again, are you going to prevent relationships altogether or just supervisory or direct supervisory relationships? Um, just something to consider what, what standards you want to set for your organization. Um, for all policies that you help create in your role and help administer, um, consistency in application is so key. Uh, it's important to not only make the policy effective, but also reduce liability for applying it one way for one person and another way for another person, um, because that can um, certainly open the door to, to a claim uh, if people are being treated differently based on the same conduct. The other thing you want to make sure is that your policies are acknowledging both supervisor and employee conduct. Um, you know, expectations for employees might be different or, and should be in some cases different from what they are for supervisors because as Beth had mentioned, your supervisors and your manager's knowledge is going to be imputed to the organization. So having policies for supervisors that say, if you have knowledge of these things, you must bring it to so-and-so's attention or this department, because it doesn't help if a supervisor knows about something and doesn't take any steps to bring it to decision makers that can make changes um, and, and help fix the situations in the end. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, uh, applying uniform policies is, is important. And think about the penalties that you will 
will offer for different policies. And one, one thing here is just to look at the organization's precedent for how you treat various situations to help establish maybe how you move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, next, conduct regular trainings. This is a big one in sexual harassment. Um, so there's sort of a twofold reason why you wanna do trainings um, for sexual harassment. One, because it can really help you reduce legal liability. Uh, Beth mentioned the Farragher-Ellerth defense and that's an affirmative defense you can use if the employer exercised reasonable care to prevent and correct any sexually harassing behavior. So prevention and correction are two key elements of that and prevention could, could um, certainly be bolstered by having sexual harassment training. So training can help you enjoy that defense if a claim ever was to arise. Uh, the second reason that training is so important is because it might be required by state law. Um, so in Maine, most work for, uh, or many workplaces, those with 15 or more employees, are going to be required to do some sexual harassment training for its employees and, and supervisors as well. Uh, Massachusetts is optional. Connecticut also has requirements. Um, but if you are in a state with a required training element, uh, it's really important to understand what the specific elements of that training is and make sure that you're meeting timelines and expectations for that to stay compliant. Jump to the next slide. So the big piece on this is this idea of love contracts, which is kind of a newer concept. It's basically when you come, you become aware of a consensual relationship between employees um, who are not either supervisor, supervisee, or direct reports. Um, it's usually used for C-suite high-level em employees, not for lower-level employees. And what it entails generally is an acknowledgement from both that there is, uh, it's consensual and an acknowledgement that they understand the mores of appropriate business behavior and will agree to behave appropriate at all business um, situations, both in the workplace and at any kind of client event or any other thing that's related to business. The, the real problem though is <clears throat> it's cumbersome to try to regulate all relationships. No employer really wants to be like the love police Honestly, it's awkward to have to insert yourself into someone's relationship. So um, I would just say it's an available resource. I want you to be aware of it. And I want you to determine whether your particular situation might be one that lends itself to that, that type of a, um, of a defense, perhaps, to a subsequent claim, claim that might arise should the relationship not work out, or should there be coworkers or other folks who feel um, that they might have a cause of action under some of the other causes of action that we've described earlier today. Another point I wanted to make very quickly because we're running low on time is um, you all are pr probably aware that Congress um, eliminated arbitration for federal contracts uh, and the president has signed that. Um, so that's not available for, for folks who have federal contracts necessarily. Um, uh, that's not a huge portion of the population, um, but the question to me, in my mind, following, you know, hashtag me too, and some of the other things that happened, say, with the governor in New York State and all that stuff is whether there, that contractual forced arbitration is going to go away. And on that same note, generally, the, the carrot for an employer to settle a claim is that they would get a non-disparagement, non-disclosure um, liquid damages, if you do disparage or disclose the, the fact of the settlement, um, there's been a movement across the country, as you can imagine, um, to eliminate the right to do that. And I know many legislatures are con considering that right now. So I would suggest that you just try to stay informed and make sure wherever you are doing business, you're aware of what, what's going on. And if you need to weigh in with your local chamber of commerce, please don't hesitate to do that. Finally, um, if you have a workers' compensation claim amongst any of the claims, please be aware that a workers' compensation claim is only settled when it's approved by the judge, the administrative law judge, hearing officer, depends on what they're called in the state. So it must be presented. And, and to settle any of the other employment-related claims, that would have to be a side agreement. It would have to have separate consideration. It doesn't have to be approved by anybody. 
but you need to keep that in mind. And there are certain jurisdictions that absolutely will not allow. And in fact, I know for a fact, there's a particular judge in Philadelphia who will question an injured worker and ask, are you planning now or in the future to release your remaining employment law claims against this employer? And if the answer is yes, she won't go forward with the settlement regardless of if, if it's in the best interest of the injured worker. So just be aware that there's a real, um, a lot of things to be thinking about. There's, there's pushback across the country and we need to stay informed on what is permissible and what we can do to get what we need in place when these situations arise. Next slide, please. Yeah. Perfect. And before we jump into this last slide on investigations, I just want to add, um, you know, it's been sort of a running theme that like, you know, stay up to date, stay up to speed on what your state's doing. And it's really um, for separation agreements and severance agreements in particular, one of the common trends we're seeing is just increases in uh, restrictions on disclosure and disparagement. So I would just really encourage each of you, um, again, especially those of you in different jurisdictions or where your company's operating in different jurisdictions, to keep tabs on the news, watch what's happening in your locale um, to see where things are moving um, legislatively and keep that in mind when, when drafting these documents. Well, not to oversell us, but you, we're always here too. You know, I hope you people feel free to reach out if you have a question. That's what Liz and I are here for. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, exactly. Um, so the last topic today, investigations. Uh, just briefly here, one of the things you may be asked to do in your role is participate in an investigation or advise on one, um, particularly for sexual harassment. Um, generally speaking, when your organization gets a claim, you should investigate it. Uh, first, because it's probably part of a sexual harassment policy and obligation to investigate an employee's allegations. Um, but even if the requirement wasn't there, you know, by statute or by policy, it's still a good idea because again, looking at that Farragher Ellerth defense, um, one of the elements is promptly correcting any sexually harassing behavior in the workplace and an employee taking advantage of those opportunities. And it's hard to correct things if you don't investigate and identify them. So it's helpful for that defense. Um, there are some risks though for in-house counsel being involved in actually performing the investigation. So one thing you'll wanna consider is just whether you do it internally, if so, who does it, and whether you have an external um, party coming in to do it. And those issues really center around whether things are gonna be protected by work product doctrine and attorney-client privilege. And um, it's a little beyond the scope of today, but please consider those issues when you're deciding whether or not to participate and how in an investigation um, to avoid waiving privilege issues and making sure that you're obtaining privilege rather than just participating in the investigation on the business side of things in your role as the company's attorney. Um, and we're always you know, happy to help with questions related to that. Thank you. Uh, those, consider, it's one of, let me just throw one thing out, Liz, and consider whether you want something written as opposed to something orally reported. Again, this all goes to strategy, but I just want to make sure we had that out there as well. Yeah, these, these are definitely issues that you want to think about before they happen and before you're put in that situation. So that's a great proactive step to consider. Um, Briefly, if you, you know, assuming that there is some sort of internal investigation done by HR and you're asked to advise on it, um, just have some of the questions listed there about what you should consider in giving that advice. Um, you know, anybody investigating sexual harassment claims should really consider the allegations, um, really, you know, come up with a plan for executing, executing an investigation, who should be interviewed, what they should be asked, what, um, what types of questions, who has knowledge, and making sure investigations are done by people without a stake um, in the investigation or who are, you know, who are gonna be able to do this without bias, um, especially in the context of having um, high you know, senior managers involved. It can be really tricky to have an internal investigation um, go on when that person you know, might have authority over the person doing the investigation or perhaps have a very close personal relationship with them. So um, something to consider. And again, um, certainly considering whether outside counsel is going to be an appropriate part of an investigative steps. 
So with that, um, I think that is all we wanted to cover today. But as Beth mentioned, we're more than happy to take questions. So um, if you want to ask them now or reach out to us privately after the presentation, we would certainly be happy to help. Yeah, I think we're out of time, but I wanted to circle back and just make one more point for Peter's excellent question earlier today, which is one of the things to consider even in a quid pro quo situation is how to limit damages. So you may be strictly liable, but how can you limit damages? And sometimes that's the best you're going to be able to do with the situation. So I just wanted to make sure I made that point and thank everybody for coming. If anybody has any other questions, we're available. Thank you.